Hello, I am Julia Wilburn. I'm the communications manager at Tennessee Craft. I'm here with Bonnie Matthews, our membership manager. Hey, Bonnie. Hey. Um, welcome to part four of our how-to videos on setting up a virtual event. Um, today we're going to talk about Zoom, um, which may be a relatively new platform for um, pretty much everybody. Uh, I know we have just recently, since the, uh, since the pandemic um, hit and forced all of us into our homes, um, <laughs> we have become uh, pretty well versed in using Zoom. We are certainly not experts at it, but uh, we wanted to share some tips today that we thought might help you. Um, so we are going to walk you through setting up a Zoom account, um, kind of how to uh, how to use some of the controls on Zoom, and um, maybe and give you a couple of examples of how you might use it uh, in a virtual event setting. So you do need an account for Zoom. You can do free accounts. Um, and the one of the drawbacks, and we'll talk about some of the other challenges to Zoom, but one of the drawbacks is that a free account um, a call can only last for 40 minutes. So that's just something to consider. Uh, you can participate in Zoom from a phone, uh, from your tablet or from your desktop. Um, the one thing to consider there is that you must have a camera and a microphone. Um, some desktops don't have that feature, so you just wanna make sure that you, um, that you have those and you test those out before you commit to this particular platform. Um, if you're coordinating or if you're incorporating a lot of participants, um, you might want to use a monitor like a desktop or a laptop rather than a handheld device because it is just it's just easier to see uh, it's easier to see all of the people on a big monitor. Um, I know when I'm on Zoom on my phone, I can only see four people at a time, and so it gets kind of uh, it's a little bit harder to uh, to use. So Bonnie's going to walk us through setting up an event. Um, Bonnie, do you want to take over that? Sure, I will do that. And I do want to say for somebody to participate in a, a Zoom event, they just have to have a link. And um, do they have to have an app, Julia? To just uh, you do have event? to have an app. You do have to download an app on whatever device you're going to use, uh, whether it's your desktop, your phone, your tablet. You do have to download the Zoom app to, um, to make it all work together. Um, but it is free and it's really easy to install. And if you have a longer event, you don't have to have a paid account just to view or participate. That would just be for the host. Right. Okay. Um, I am going to attempt to screen share with you guys and show you how you would set up a Zoom event. I'm going to go into my personal Zoom account since Julia and I are using our work account right now to record this. And let me do that. So from Zoom, you will have an account that you've set up. This is my personal account. Um, and you will just log in with whatever um, details you have set up when you originally create the Zoom account. So this is what you will see when you open up the, um, the initial Zoom portal. And scheduling an event is very easy. You just go to schedule a new meeting and say, um, say I want to do a studio tour. And could do it anytime. Let's say I want to do this studio tour during Tennessee Craft Week. Uh, that first weekend would be a Saturday. You could do it at noon. Um, and you can see here, my personal account is not um, upgraded to the paid version, and so I have a 40-minute time limit on meetings with three or more participants. Um, so if you are planning on doing a lot of teaching or something like that, um, where you are going to have longer events, then a paid subscription is something you might consider. It's less than $20 a month. Um, but Otherwise, I could create a shorter event. A lot of studio tours will probably be not, not super long. Um, I can make this recurring. Okay. You do want to set up a password. Um, it is very important that whoever logs in for security purposes has a password. And we'll get to that in a bit. I would like to have my video on. 
and then you can decide whether you want your participants to have their video on or off. So if you want to see the people who are participating in your event, then have the video on. If you just want to broadcast to them, say you're giving a lecture or doing a demo and you're doing it via Zoom, then, um, then you might want to keep their video off. Typically for Zoom, I think it's valuable to see your participants, so I would turn this on. Um, you can enable your participants to join before you are um, in the meeting so that if you're a little late, they're not, not left waiting. Um, you can mute them upon entry. I always like to select this. Then you have the control over who's speaking. And if they come in and there's a lot of background noise and the kids are talking and the dog is barking, then all of that is not clouding up your space. Um, and then you can selectively um, uh, unmute people later or um, all at once. Um, you can also record the meeting to the local computer. I've not done that before, but. All right, so once I save this event, I have my date. Um, I can add it to my calendars. The important thing is that um, I have a meeting invitation here. So where you see invite link right here, this is how people are going to get into your event. If I hit, this is a lot trimmed down, Julia. I'm surprised. This is a lot more trimmed down. I think it's because you have a free account and. I uh, love it. If I you do. have a paid account, it gives you all these options to phone in with all these phone numbers. It can get. It's a really, lot of information. It's a lot. It can be really junky to look at that yeah. and figure out what you need to share. This is actually, I love this. It's much more mm -hmm. streamlined. Um, and what you can do here is copy this and it will save it as you see onto your clipboard. And then you can paste this into um, an email. You can put it in a text. I do not recommend that you share it publicly. We will get to that in just a minute. But um, what your participant needs is this link right here to your meeting, and they need your password. They can also go into the Zoom app with the meeting ID and the password um, without having that link, and they can still join your meeting. But these are the important details that you would want to share with someone. Zoom makes it really easy for you, again, to just copy this to your clipboard and then paste it into a message that you would send to someone you were inviting to your event. Um, oh, so um, this password is really crucial because mm -hmm. there is there has been recently a trend called zooming where meetings have been zoomed or do are there other phrases uh, zoom bombing zoom bombing yes okay zoom bombing where um if your meeting information is shared publicly anyone can get onto it and they may not have the best intentions in mind when they join your event um Inappropriate content has been shared. The worst cases of this were in school meetings at the very beginning of the pandemic where um, content that was inappropriate for children was shared in a Zoom meeting. I say that, I get really detailed on this description because I want you to know how important it is that you don't just publicly share your meeting details from Zoom. So you're gonna have to think about how you get that information to someone without just posting here's my meeting ID or here's the link and here's the password on your Facebook or Instagram or, you know, on your website. Don't do it. Make sure that, um, that you're sharing that information privately. Like we said, you want to plan to share the login information with um, the individuals who are interested in being part of your, part of your Zoom meeting, your demonstration, your studio tour, whatever it is that you are wanting to do. Um, I can I can tell you um, how we've done it with Tennessee Craft and with um, our Tennessee Craft Week calls. Um, I have personally I've created a simple um, Google form where if people are interested in being part of the meeting, they just fill out the form with um, their information and their email address, and then I send them the link and the login information to the Zoom call 24 hours before that call happens. You don't have to do it that way. You can have them email you. You can have them respond to an email, text you, however that is. It's just, that's just an easy way for me personally to gather information. But you just want to invite people to your Zoom call, give them the information as far as what it is, when it is, um, 
you know, and, and what you're going to be talking about. And then if they're interested, then that's when you would give them the login information. Um, so something to consider is if you want a, a backup person to let people in or to have the information once you start the event, it's kind of hard to, once you're the host and you are, um, you know, you're hosting the meeting, um, it's hard to kind of go back and forth and go, oh, I forgot to, I, you know, somebody came in late and they, they, they want the, the login information. So to give, you know, another person um, that, that responsibility could make it a little easier on you as the host. Um, we recommend that you try it with a friend before you host a public event. Um, we've had we do that. <laughs> we do that a lot. Uh, we have had several um, several Zoom meetings. Um, I know I've referenced the Tennessee Craft Week uh, video calls that we've had, and we're going to show you one of those later. Um, but we definitely practice. We make sure everybody's ready. We kind of talk things through um, and just get comfortable with it before you do a public call. So that's, um, that's something that, that has helped us. Um, so how the meeting works, um, there are just really basic controls. Um, they're down at the bottom. Uh, you can, you, like Bonnie said, you can uh, mute everyone when they come in. You can, um, you know, have someone, you can unmute them as the host. You have the, the control over that. Um, there is a chat feature um, where people can ask questions. Um, if they want to, they can chat with everyone who's participating or they can chat uh, privately with you, the host, or with another participant. Um, one thing to remember is that if you are recording the, uh, if you're recording the Zoom call, there is a transcript of the, of the chat that comes in um, after, the, after the recording is finished. Um, the, the host can start the meeting, uh, like Bonnie said, with everyone muted. Um, that's usually how we do it. It also, um, it also helps w to reduce uh, feedback. So a lot of times there can be, uh, there can be some background noise, but there can also be just that microphone feedback that you get. Um, and so muting everyone except the person who's talking really helps to cut down on that. Um, there is the option to record. Uh, you can either record as soon as it starts, or if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a record button and you can record a short section of it um, so that you can go back and, uh, you know, replay it at, as, you, as you need to. Um, one of the other things that sometimes confuses people is the view options. Um, this is usually, uh, you can fix this in the top right hand corner of your screen. You can either have a speaker view where the person who's speaking is the one person that you see on the screen, or you can have a grid view. Um, and a grid view is, is everybody kind of in that tile Brady Bunch looking <laughs> layout. Um, so that is controlled by each individual user. So um, the host does not, con does not control how that layout works. So that's something that your, um, your participants may not know. Um, is that they can control what they see. Um, Bonnie, do you want to talk about what the, uh, some of the, the strengths for using Zoom, why, why somebody might choose Zoom as a platform? Yes, I will do that. But I wanted to say really quickly, mm -hmm. I think when we post this on YouTube, we'll share some links to um, Zoom tutorials on how yes. to host. Um, in the comments and that will give you a little bit more um, in-depth you know it's hard for us to show you the controls right now right. because we are in the middle of it um, but that will give you a little bit more of a run through through those specific mm -hmm. buttons and controls the different views and again just try it with a friend just have you know have a, a brunch online invite a friend play around with the controls invite all of your friends invite yeah. your you know your study group or whatever um and and you can uh, you can try out all of those controls before you are live for your big event <laughs> so strengths um so each of the three platforms that we're profiling in this series have um, particular strengths and weaknesses the biggest strength of zoom is that you can have multiple active participants at once in your event so 
you are there leading the meeting, um, or maybe you're talking to someone else who is actually providing more of the content, or maybe there's a series of you that are providing content together. Um, if you definitely have multiple speakers for one event, then Zoom is a way to go because you're not going to be able to do that on Facebook or Instagram if you are remote from each other, if you're not in the same physical space. So multiple active participants, both leading the meeting, um, providing the content, as well as being able to interact with you. So um, participants in the Zoom call can have a conversation with each other. Um, they can add elements into the whole collaboratively. So if you're working on a concept for an event or um, you know, a future art project in your community, that might be something that you want to host on Zoom. And many people can bring their different perspectives and ideas together in that one place. Um, the host can see the participants <laughs> in Zoom. So if you're talking on Facebook in that lecture format, um, you can't really see who's out there. You might see that they're watching in certain, um, certain apps. Uh, different variations of the Facebook app, um, or you can see that they're commenting, but you can't interact with them directly. You can't actually see their faces, and you can with Zoom, so that's really cool. You, um, you can actually keep your content private with Zoom in a way that you can't with Facebook or Instagram, so that's going to really depend on the nature of your event. If you want to have a meeting that you just want the core um, decision makers to be in, then Zoom is, is definitely the way you want to do that as opposed to being uh, public on Facebook or Instagram. But also if you're creating content that is targeted for a specific group, say um, you have a technique that you have created on your own with your craft and you want to charge you know, whatever fee is appropriate to share that technique with other artists and you're going to limit your Zoom call just to people who pay for that content. You can do that, and you don't have that, that capability with Facebook or Instagram. Um, you also, and I don't know if this is available with the free or with just the paid, um, but you do have waiting rooms um, with um, Zoom. And do you have rooms as well, Julia? Where you, you can, can, do, you can do breakout rooms where... Um, and I've, I have not used that feature before, but there is an option to do breakout rooms where you put, uh, you know, if you wanted to have multiple discussions happening at once and then everybody come back together, you can put people in breakout rooms. Um, so that's kind of a more advanced, um, advanced option. So that would be more like in a workshop where mm -hmm. you're breaking people down or in a classroom setting where you're, right. you're breaking students down into smaller groups and then bringing it back together. Um, but the waiting room feature in Zoom is to just have an individual conversation with one person at a time and then potentially bring them all back together or not. Um, again, we'll, send, we'll put links in with more details um, from Zoom themselves about how these things work, um, but that just is an option that's not available with Facebook or Instagram because what you put out there is live and available to everyone who has access to your Facebook or Instagram account. Um, you can also invite um, particular groups to an invitation-only event. So not necessarily just a paid event, but if you say you have a collector's group, you have a group that has really invested in your art over the years, you'd like to get them together for a special event just to say thank you and to show maybe something new that you've been working on. That could be a really cool way to develop your business, your brand, to develop your collector community. And so, um, whereas again, Facebook and Instagram is, is public to everyone. Zoom would allow you to create um, a special patrons group and just provide content to them. Right. What are some challenges of using? There are some challenges to using Zoom. Um, one of those that we um, that I touched on earlier is that a free account is limited to forty minutes. Um, there are you know there are workarounds to that. Um, you can set up you know if you feel like you're you're going to go over 40 minutes, you can set up a, a couple of Zooms back to back and everybody just sort of hops from one to the other. Uh, that's a little clunky to me that, that um, it's just, it just makes it harder on your participants. So if you, like Bonnie said, if you are um, anticipating doing longer than 40 minutes, um, 
for, uh, you know, for several virtual events that you might be, might be doing, you might look into a paid account because it's, it, it is less than $20 a month. Um, another challenge is that, um, some of the security issues that we mentioned, like the zoom bombing or, um, just privacy, um, it does require a password and we really, we really encourage you to, if you're going to use Zoom, to set up a password and, and only give it to the people who you've, uh, who you've invited. Um, getting the login information to your potential viewers, that's something that is a totally a personal preference. As I said, um, I, I like that um, I've set up a Google form, I can just go in grab the email addresses of the people who want to be on our Tennessee Craft Week calls and just, um, you know, shoot an email off to them really, really quickly. Um, that's, that's not to say that there's a, you know, not a better way to do that. Um, or if you're not comfortable with that, you know, just have them email you and say, Hey, I'm interested or, um, you know, have them text you, have them send you a Facebook message, any of those, any of those ways. It's just a matter of gathering the email addresses, um, and getting the contact information to them in, um, in the easiest way possible for you as the host. Um, another, another challenge is that participants in order to get into that, that zoom call, your participants do have to register beforehand because you've got to give them the information. You have to give them the login information. It's not like Facebook and Instagram where you just hop on and there you are and you're talking. Um, it does require some advanced planning. Um, and it's challenging to add new participants who want to join, but then they haven't requested the login information. So, um, you so maybe they heard that the meeting is at noon today right. and at noon they're like, Hey, how do I get in? Oh, I don't know how I get, get in. in. <laughs> so you might need to have, you know, you might want to have somebody, somebody else who is um, available to say, oh, you didn't get the Zoom information. Here it is. Let me, you know, let me add you. So you do have to kind of balance those. Um, I know for one of our Tennessee Craft Week calls, uh, we had an, um, a participant who um, had signed up after I had sent out the information and I didn't realize that, that he wasn't, um, wasn't on there. So that was just, it was a little bit, um, it's just, it, it can just be a little bit problematic to, um, try to do all of that by yourself. So you might want to work with, with a, a partner or, um, you know, a, a close colleague to, to kind of, uh, mitigate those issues. So what would you use Zoom for as an artist? Um, well, I would say, if you're doing a virtual event, things like, like what you said, like a patron only event, um, something that is that you're inviting people to, that's like a, um, you know, like you said, like a, a private event, um, you know, a happy hour would be great. Um, an interactive demonstration with a Q and a afterwards, because, um, like we said in that, that, um, the grid, format of Zoom, you can, you know, people can really interact with each other and, um, you know, you're maybe demonstrating your craft and then people are asking you questions in real time. And so then you can, you know, you can answer them rather than having to wait um, and, you know, go back through like a Facebook comment stream or, or that kind of, that kind of layout. Um, we are there have used them a lot for our chapter events mm -hmm. in the past few months because we have chapters as an organization we have chapters across the state of Tennessee and the different development districts and they typically will meet at least quarterly sometimes as much as monthly um, and they've done some really neat things our uh, mid-state chapter has done uh, a studio tour of a local gallery that I'd always wanted to visit and so it was great to be able to walk through with someone who works with that gallery and see all of the different art and artists that are represented there. Our Plateau chapter has done studio tours in homes um, and interviews um, and so that and, and they've been able to bring in the whole chapter leadership to talk to the person because they were using Zoom um, and that allowed more participants to talk. And um, our, I think our Southwest chapter just did a meeting on how to set up an Instagram account for our Tennessee Craft Week Instagram. They did, um, our Instagram contest. Contest. Um, our Tennessee Craft Week calls, um, I have recorded them all and I've put them on our YouTube channel um, just so that people who maybe weren't able to participate can go back and watch them if they're looking for that kind of information. So I'm going to share my screen. 
Um, so here is, I'll just play a little bit of it, but this is um, a call from a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm Julia Wilbur, I'm the communications manager at Tennessee Pratt, um, and we are excited that you all are here with us today. Um, so Tennessee Pratt Week is, um, as many of you know, some of you may not have participated in Tennessee Pratt Week before, but as many of you know, it's a collection of craft events and happenings across the state each October. It coincides with American Craft Week. And the purpose of Tennessee Craft Week is to connect and celebrate craft artists, the work that you all create, and the businesses that support you. And so but by focusing attention on many craft events in a short time, we can shine a spotlight on the collective impact that made in Tennessee Craft Week have on our culture, community, and our economy. Um, so I want to welcome you all again, and we're glad that you're here. Um, there are several new faces here with us today, um, so we're going to do a little bit of a recap from our last Zoom meeting, and then we're going to give you some new information um, regarding our Instagram contest. We're going to talk to a couple of people um, from our events from last year, and if you want to use the chat function down at the bottom, uh, you can ask questions and we'll post, uh, we can have a Q&A at the end of our session. I'm going to turn it over to Mary Grissom. She's our Tennessee Craft, one of our Tennessee Craft Week consultants, and she's going to tell you a little bit about it. Thanks, Julia. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we're really excited about. So that is just one quick example. That was mostly me talking, but. Uh, this is a quick example of what the layout looks like. Um, you can see that um, I was able to see to see Mary, who I, you know, invited her to speak. She then uh, passed it off to Laurie Davis, who's our uh, PR consultant, and then Laurie then passed off the uh, the microphone to um, some of our past participants in Tennessee Craft Week, and everybody could see each other. Um, and so that was really. It was just really helpful. It's a it, it can be kind of an organic um, environment, and it is it you know if we can't meet in person, it's a great way to have a conversation and be face to face and see each other. Mm -hmm. um, so we really uh, we we really feel like this platform is is good for um, especially larger group gatherings like that. So we hope that um, if you do have a specific event that you just want to invite a lot of people to, you want to create some community, you want them to be able to talk with each other potentially, that you would consider giving Zoom a shot. You will not be able to um, just share it publicly to promote yourself um, in real time. Um, so that's, that's a drawback, but, um, but it does have its advantages as well. Yeah. So thank you all for watching these how-to videos and we hope that they are helpful. Um, if you have questions, you can reach us by email. Uh, my email is marketing at tennesseecraft.org and Bonnie is reachable at membership at tennesseecraft.org. So if you have questions, please feel free to email us. Uh, we will do our best to answer them and if we don't know the answer, we'll find it for you. So we hope that um, you will consider participating in Tennessee Craft Week and maybe host your own virtual event. And we look forward to seeing what you all can come up with. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.